Good evening and welcome to the PAX Monday show on Dark City Radio. Uh, I'm Nigel, your uh, host, uh, bringing you uh, news of uh, resistance to war and peace news. Um, tonight our uh, special guest is Eamon Jundi, uh, General Secretary of uh, Syrian Relief. Uh, good evening, Eamon. Good evening, Nigel. And welcome. Um, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for uh, having me. And uh, I wonder, could you uh, first of all uh, tell us uh, about uh, Syria Relief, uh, how it was uh, set up and uh, what kind of work you do? Yes. Um, well, um, the Syrian uprising started back in March 2011 and we immediately realized that there was an immediate need for um, financial support for displaced families. We started informally by collecting money from friends and colleagues and what have you and taking it over there by hand. But then we quickly realized that this is going to be a long, long way and that we needed a, a, a formal official vehicle for fundraising and we set up Syria Relief. It's a UK-based charity. It was set up in September 2011 and that was in response to the crisis that had engulfed Syria. It is bound by all the laws and regulations of, uh, that govern uh, the uh, work of charitable organizations under the auspices of the Charity Commission. What really sets us apart from other charities is our distinct ability to operate inside the country through an intricate and comprehensive network of contacts and humanitarian workers who are actually able to work inside Syria. Most other major charities can only work with the refugees in uh, neighboring countries such as Jordan, Turkey and uh, Lebanon, but very few can actually get into the country like we can. Um, in terms of our work, there are five streams, if you like, to our activities. We, uh, the first of all is healthcare and emergency medical uh, help. We have a number of field hospitals. We uh, fund a major hospital at the Turkish border. We provide mobile clinics, chronic illness clinics and primary care centers. All that is done through our volunteers and funded primarily from the donations of um, the uh, generous people that uh, support us. Um, second, we concentrate on water, sanitation and hygiene. We have uh, identified a serious need there, obviously, and we started digging wells and operating them. We have water storage tanks, uh, generators and pumps. Uh, water purification and chlorination facilities, etc. Third, we have uh, food security and livelihood. The displaced communities suffer shortage of food and obviously food has become more and more expensive in Syria. And we work very hard to provide food baskets, flour for bakeries. Uh, there are a number of bakeries that we have taken over, if you like, and refurbished and started uh, operating again. Um, and one of the main uh, thrusts of our activities, particularly now in the holy month of Ramadan, is food baskets and trying to feed families throughout the, the, the holy month. Um, other activities involve education. We ha have been working on reopening uh, cl schools that have closed. Uh, we repair them and we start some form of education for the displaced population. We're funding the refurbishment of the schools, the stocking with the equipment of the schools, the school books, staffing, and everything that involves school meals, everything that is involved in running of a, a fully fledged school. We have finally social programs, namely orphan support and uh, mental health clinics, which are going to be very, very seriously needed uh, to help people get over the trauma of the past couple of years. Okay, uh, thank you, Eamon. Uh, clearly, you're uh, d doing uh, a, a wide range of uh, work and, uh, you know, providing uh, valuable uh, support uh, uh, to displaced uh, people. Uh, now, uh, for the benefit of our listeners who uh, might not know that much about 
what's happening in Syria. I wonder if you could, uh, you know, tell us uh, more about the uh, situation in Syria. Um, could, could you uh, perhaps give us some numbers on the uh, numbers of displaced civilians, uh, yes. both within Syria and externally in neighbouring countries, and what kind of resources are, are available uh, to support those uh, displaced people? Well, according to a recent UN report, there are some 1.6 million refugees who have fled Syria to the safety of neighboring countries, namely um, Jordan, Turkey, and Lebanon. In addition, and in fact more of a concern, is the fact that there are 4.5 million internally displaced people who have fled their homes um, but remained inside Syria. They basically moved from hotspots to areas of relative safety, which actually placed a substantial um, burden on the host areas because these areas are already stretched because of the lack of resources and all of a sudden these four and a half million people have uh, descended on the, the uh, slightly less volatile areas. So the infrastructure, the facilities that are available are seriously stretched. Compounded by that, the access is extremely difficult for humanitarian and uh, relief organizations to actually reach those in, uh, internally displaced communities. In a, another recent UN report, they estimate that there are something like 6.8 million Syrians who are now unable to grow or buy enough food. So that's a quarter of the population in the country is facing starvation and famine. By simple calculation, you can imagine that the, the difficulties that we're facing um, it will obviously immediately um, become uh, clear that the need is much higher inside the country than outside it. And also, knowledge of the situation on the ground would tell you that it is far more difficult to actually support people inside the country than it is to help the refugees. Refugees in neighboring countries can be reached relative ease if the resources are available. And major international relief organizations are on the whole able to deliver aid to that group of uh, refugees. Substantial funds are needed indeed, and the logistics, complex as they are, remain relatively uh, straightforward in relation to what we're facing, trying to deliver aid into Syria itself. And that's, as I said, where our strength really lies, the ability to deliver aid to Syria across the country, throughout the, the areas inside the borders of Syria, despite all the difficulties. So the resources really are primarily at the moment available for the refugees through the host countries and the international relief organizations and through which smaller charities like ours uh, were managing to take uh, the, the aid into Syria itself. But we're really just dealing with the tip of the iceberg because the, uh, the, the magnitude of the uh, disaster is just beyond imagination. Okay, well, uh, thanks for that, uh, Eamon. Um, I wonder, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you mentioned, um, you know, the uh, uh, major agencies. I wonder if you have any comments uh, regarding the recent uh, statement made by the uh, UN Committee uh, for Human Rights uh, envoy, Angelina Jolie, uh, which she, she made that in Jordan, uh, I believe, on UN refugee uh, That's day. Right. Yeah, Angelina Jolie gave actually a very poignant and eloquent appeal to the leaders of the free world to work to bring an end to the appalling violence that is engulfing our peaceful, tolerant and beautiful Syria. We in Syria Relief would actually like to add our voice to Ms. Jolie's plea. What can the UN do? Well, the UN and the world can start by leaning more effectively and more forcefully on all parts to somehow force a ceasefire and bring about a negotiated end to the crisis. That's really the most pressing requirement at the moment. Stop the fighting, stop the killing, allow the displaced populations to return to their uh, homes. 
the world and the UN can and perhaps should provide more active, systematic and coordinated humanitarian relief efforts. The crisis is real and present and it needs action that is equally real and immediate. We need protection for humanitarian workers, safe corridors, safe havens, whatever. But these people who are risking life and limb to deliver um, relief to the needy population inside Syria do need a lot of protection. And they are not really at the moment afforded any. The magnitude of the disaster is such that only intergovernmental campaign can cope with it. If you, I mean, looking at the figure of 6.8 million uh, people who are unable to feed themselves, if you spend $10 a day on each of these 6.8 million, that is $68 million a day. That is $25 billion a year. That is bigger than the whole budget of a small country. No small charity or big charity or even a country on its own is going to be able to face up to that challenge. We need international cooperation. We need big intergovernmental bodies to step in and step up the aid for the Syrian refugees. Otherwise, we are going to face a a, a tragedy that is literally never been seen before. Thanks for that. So do do you think that uh, Western nations like uh, the UK uh, government should be uh, doing more and, um, you you know, to uh, try to uh, assist the situation? And if so, what, what what do you think they should be doing? What should we be demanding that our politicians uh, do? We're very grateful for all the uh, uh, relief aid that has been offered by some um, Western governments, including the UK government, that has focused on helping the refugees mostly outside the country. What we really need is a really sustained and coordinated effort to press on the authorities in Syria to provide safe areas for the refugees inside Syria and for intergovernmental organizations to uh, provide enough funds, enough support, logistics, um, etc., for those people. It is, as I said, well beyond the capacity of any single uh, charity, no matter how big it is. In fact, it is probably beyond any single country. It needs an international campaign. So we really need to lean on the governments, um, as I said, primarily to pressurize uh, all parties, those who are fighting and those who are supporting them, to Uh, press towards a uh, negotiated settlement. In the meantime, much, much more needs to be done to provide uh, aid for the uh, hungry masses. Okay, uh, thanks, um, Eamon. Now, I know that uh, recently uh, the Syrian Relief uh, Organization has been uh, doing some filming in Syria, uh, I uh, wonder um, where, how and when is that uh, film footage going to be released? Um, will it be available uh, for uh, the general public uh, to view? And uh, w- what other um, media and multimedia resources would you recommend uh, for uh, listeners who are trying to understand what's happening I- in Syria now. Indeed, a team of highly talented professionals have filmed in Syria recently and in the ref- refugee camps, both inside and outside Syria. And they have created a sensitive and very touching record of life in Syria today. Um, and it also highlighted the efforts of Syria Relief and the work that we are doing there to help these people. Um, The film is currently being processed and will soon be available online. There is a short version of it already available on the Syria Relief uh, YouTube channel, and it is actually also on our website. So if you go to uh, uh, syriarelief.org.uk, and on the uh, homepage there's a section for videos, and in that, If you look for a video called Syria Relief on the ground in Syria, it's about two and a half minute 
clip of uh, the much longer and much more comprehensive production, but it is a taste of the, the whole uh, film. It is also uh, available, as I said, on the Syria Relief uh, YouTube channel. So again, if you go to uh, YouTube, look for Syria Relief and search for that video, Syria Relief on the ground in Syria. With regards to information about the suffering of the refugees, it is readily available and in abundance. It, you'll find it on YouTube videos, in documentaries, on various websites, uh, like various charities such as Save the Children, with, with, with whom we cooperate very closely, UNICEF, Human Appeal International, and many, many other uh, charities. Every major charity is now involved in helping the Syrian refugees, as I said, primarily outside Syria but they have all produced uh, various documentaries and various um, video clips on the situation there. There are also lots of written material that can be easily accessed on the internet. Yeah, I, I know uh, my, myself, I, I've been um, seeing a lot of uh, coverage of the uh, situation in Syria and particularly the plight of refugees on uh, Al Jazeera. Yes. Yes, there has been a lot of uh, filming by Al Jazeera and other uh, Arabic satellite uh, channels and a lot of uh, um, work, a lot of coverage has gone to look at the suffering of the refugees. In fact, there has been a couple of very good reports about our work in Jordan in particular. We have recently set up uh, two workshops for refugee women uh, in Jordan we provided them with um, a venue for uh, one for, uh, workshop is for uh, needlework and needlecraft and what have you. And these ladies produce these um, uh, articles and we sell them. All the money generated from that goes back into the workshop itself to uh, develop it and expand it. We also have got an, in the same uh, vein, if you like, we have a, a Syrian kitchen. And the, uh, you know, Syrian food is renowned in the region for its uh, variety and delicacy. And the Syrian ladies who are experts in that uh, culinary art are using their talents to uh, produce food and sell it in Jordan and in the neighboring, in, sorry, mostly in Jordan, actually. And again, all the money that is generated feeds back into these workshops. The ladies who work there are paid a salary from Syria Relief. And uh, that really, first of all, helps them regain some of their self-worth that they have lost as a result of these uh, events. And also, it, the money that they earn from, from working for, uh, for in these workshops help them support their families. We've got something like 25 ladies. That's 25 families that are not needing help. They are actually self-supporting now, uh, thanks to the, uh, these two workshops. And we're looking at expanding and, and uh, having more. Yeah, that sounds very positive. You know, I really like uh, that angle because I, I, I do think that one of the problems with uh, aid is that, uh, you know, for, for uh, people who, who are uh, displaced is that it, it makes them uh, dependent. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and our, we're really trying to break that, circuit, that, that vicious circle. Yeah. We want to get these people dependent again, productive again, thinking hope and thinking positively once again. Okay, um, we're going to have a uh, short uh, music break. Is that okay, uh, Amen? That's, sounds good. We'll come back to you shortly. We're going to uh, listen to a uh, tune by uh, Syrian uh, vocalist Asala Nasri. Excellent. We'll be back shortly. I'm a 
أبيك تحس وتتعلم ما بيتصرخ وتتألم أبيك تحس وتتعلم أبيك تشوف هالدنيا عينك صارت صغيرة عيش وجرب Okay, um, welcome back to the uh, PAX Monday show, and uh, we're here with our uh, special guest, Eamon Jundi, uh, General Secretary of Syrian Syria Relief, a uh, charity providing aid to uh, refugees from the Syria conflict. Um, now, uh, Aidan, uh, Eamon, uh, I wonder if you could uh, tell us more about your uh, uh, activities, the... Uh, medical aid and uh, food aid, if you could elaborate on uh, you know, yes. those uh, activities. With pleasure. With pleasure. Um, clearly, as a result of the crisis, there has been a large number of um, casualties, war casualties. 
To compound the problem, there's been a systematic and deliberate destruction of the uh, healthcare infrastructure in the country as a result of deliberate attacks on these facilities. Obviously, the result of that is that people are uh, dying from simple injuries purely because there is no facilities to care for them. And that's where City Relief was able to step in. We have established uh, mobile medical points. Uh, we have uh, that are staffed by uh, doctors and nurses and technicians. Uh, we have set up small field hospitals where we have a fixed structure that is staffed again by volunteers, doctors, medic, um, paramedics and, and uh, nurses. Um, and the wounded are brought in there, they're dealt with and if necessary they're transferred outside the country to uh, other medical facilities. We've also been collecting money and raising funds to uh, buy ambulances and we have sent a number of convoys of ambulances that we have acquired uh, in the UK um, through various uh, charities. We raised the money, we bought the ambulances and our volunteers actually drove them part of the way and carried them in ferries the rest of the way to Turkey and then into Syria. And they are uh, they've been used to great uh, benefit to uh, take patients and casualties from the embattled areas to the medical facilities. We have a particularly uh, visionary and um, pioneering project. Um, as a result of these war injuries, lots of people have lost limbs and a, an amputee is not just a burden on himself, but is also unable to support his or her family. So by helping one person recover and regain the ability to earn, you're actually taking a whole family out of that um, pond, out of that vicious situation. So we set up a, um, an artificial limb project on uh, Turkish soil, uh, very close to the Syrian borders. And it's a very pragmatic and very practical uh, setup. The injured person has to come to the facility itself. They have their, the stump measured. The limb, the artificial limb will be manufactured while they are having their initial physiotherapy and rehabilitation training. Then the, within a, a couple of hours, the limb will be fitted. They will have a few more hours of training and off they go, literally walking within one setting. Uh, the quality of the limb is quite basic but it is cheap and it is functional. It might not be necessarily aesthetically appealing, but it actually looks like a foot, looks like a leg and functions like one. Uh, and that's really what we're after at this stage. We're after something that is cheap, functional and can allow people to get back on their feet literally and start making uh, a living to support themselves and their families. Uh, that is done in conjunction with a, three other organizations, all Syrian organizations that are scattered in uh, diaspora, if you like, uh, all medically oriented charities uh, under the umbrella of a union that brings together all uh, Syrian uh, medical relief organizations in, uh, across the world. Um, and, and as I said, that's really the jewel in our medical crown, if you like. In terms of uh, food aid, um, as I touched on earlier, we have extensive programs to uh, deliver food to the needy families across the country. We try our best to acquire the food locally. We buy the food in Syria. That helps keep the local economy going. It means that the local suppliers can actually work and they can uh, raise money and they can employ people and all that actually keeps the economy to a certain degree functioning. When we can't do that, we sometimes have to buy uh, food supplies from neighboring countries such as Turkey or, or uh, Jordan in particular, but mostly Turkey. Um, uh, but we prefer, as I said, to do it locally. We provide uh, baby milk uh, for, for babies and a donation of 10 pounds is actually enough for us to buy baby milk 
for one child for a whole month. It's that kind of donation uh, that will really be um, sustaining our activity. We're not expecting masses and masses of uh, big donations. Any small donation is actually immensely helpful. Same thing with food baskets. A uh, donation of £25 will allow us to feed a family of five for a whole month. Food is relatively cheap in Syria, and we can acquire it at uh, uh, fairly low prices. So very small donations actually go a very, very long way over there. Um, in addition, as I said, to the bakeries that we have set up, uh, one big bakery is hopefully going to go online by the end of the month and will be able to provide uh, food, uh, sorry, bread, um, practically free of charge for all that who need it. Uh, so I, uh, uh, sorry, carry on. Uh, I was just saying that's primarily the, um, you know, the, our efforts in terms of uh, medical aid and food supplies. Yeah, I was just going to comment that really, uh, I think the, the the model that you have, the way that you're uh, sourcing, for example, the, the food, you know, from uh, uh, local uh, markets yes. you know, is really commendable. You know, that, that it, 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 it is, uh, you know, um, uh, really different uh, to the uh, traditional model, as, as I understand. Exactly. Charities it makes import. Sense. Uh, uh, products which actually undermine the local market. Indeed, indeed. The way we're doing it makes perfect sense. As I said, we're maintaining the local uh, supply chain. The uh, producers, the wholesalers, the uh, retailers are all able to continue to function. What was happening in, until we uh, intervened in that area was that the food was available, but people hadn't any money to buy it. Mm. So by providing the financial support, we're able to uh, get into that and, as I said, maintain the, um, the chain operating. There are some difficulties distributing the food to the needy uh, areas, but we're managing that thanks to the major, major effort that our uh, workers on the ground actually do and our volunteers in South Syria uh, achieve. Yeah, uh, well, thanks for that. I, I think that really is uh, commendable, uh, the way that you're operating. It's v v very positive. Um, now, um, I'd just like to uh, really ask you if you can go into details about how our listeners might uh, uh, find out more about uh, Syria Relief and uh, get involved and maybe, you know, try and help the work of uh, Syria Relief. Well, that's, that's fantastic. You can find out more about Syria Relief by going to our website, www.syriarelief.org.uk. The website is uh, quite, at the moment, is a little bit busy. We are in the process of upgrading it to a much more user-friendly environment, but at the moment it contains a lot of information. It might take a little bit of effort finding uh, that information. Um, how can people help? Well, they can help in quite a few ways. The least you can do is spread the word. Be our mouthpiece in your community, in your place of work, in your school, in your university, in your church, in your mosque, everywhere you are, you can actually spread the word about Syria Relief. Find out more about our work through our website and let everybody know about us and let tell them to tell their friends as well. Word of mouth is a very powerful means Second, we're always looking for volunteers to help in our office and during our events. We have many fundraising events that are happening, particularly in the month of Ramadan. As I said, we've got quite an abundance of those, but we have them throughout the year. Um, if you uh, look at the contact details of the Syria Relief Office on our website, you can uh, give the office a ring and offer your uh, services as a volunteer, and I'm sure they'll be able to put you in, in you know, put your skills to very good use. Um, we'd much rather you help us this way. We don't really want people to risk anything by going to Syria unless they are, or to, to neighboring countries, unless they are part of a, a, a setup, part of an organization. So really, we would much rather you help us here in the UK so that we can help people in Syria with our local knowledge and our local contacts, rather than people from the UK risking, you know, either 
uh, their lives or, or their livelihood really by going there. Um, third, you can actually organize fundraising events yourself if you have an idea like a sponsored run, a sponsored skydive, a sponsored walk. Please let us know. We have set up a fundraising profile on BT My Donate website. If you Google it and then when you get to My Donate, uh, look for the Syria Relief uh, page and um, have fun while you're raising money for us. I personally ran the Manchester 10K with my uh, two daughters and my son-in-law. And between us, uh, we raised eight and a half thousand pounds. The whole Syria Relief team on that day raised 14,000 pounds. Not bad for a day's work. Well, it's actually more than a day's work, but you know what I mean. It was the effort. It was the, uh, the enjoyment of the atmosphere. And of course, on top of that, we raised a substantial amount of money of which we are very proud. Finally, you can actually donate money towards our uh, projects and our campaigns. Any donation, small or large, will be most welcome, gratefully accepted and deeply appreciate, appreciated. As I said before, food is relatively cheap over there and a very small donation, 10, 15, 20 pounds, will go a very long way to support a family or a, a, a school or a clinic or whatever uh, in, in Syria. And we would really rely quite heavily on very small donations. Most of our uh, funds that we have raised, and we have raised over three and a half million pounds so far, and spent most of it, uh, most of that fund actually came from small donors. We do have some corporate donors and some big charities supporting us, but the vast majority of that sum that I've mentioned, three and a half million pounds, is actually from the 10, 20, 25 pounds stream of donations. So if you go to our website, click on the donating tab, it will tell you about all the means and ways that you can donate to City Relief, be it through PayPal, internet banking, SMS text messaging, or old fashioned checks and cash. Any means, any way, any size, any amount is most greatly appreciated. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eamon. And, um you know, just uh, I'm sure that there are people out there who are going to want to uh, support the work that you're uh, doing. You know, what you've been telling uh, us about the work of Syria Relief uh, tonight is uh, really uh, fascinating, you know, and uh, uh, commendable, you know, uh, uh, really uh, uh, what you and uh, your colleagues are doing. Thank so, you very much. Thanks for uh, coming on this show. Amen. Okay. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. No, it's our pleasure. Uh, do you have any last words? Um, um, well, yes, just, um, you know, when people are sitting comfortably in their home, just remember that there are fellow human beings who are actually really suffering badly uh, to, due to a fault, none of their own fault. Uh, circumstances have um, collaborated against them, and as a result, they are in dire need for our help. And um, from on a very basic human level, it's our duty to do something to try to get them out of this sticky situation. Thank you very much, Eamon. Uh, that was uh, Eamon Jundi, uh, General Secretary of uh, Syria Relief. And um, now we're going to go to uh, another musical break. We're just going to uh, have another short song from uh, uh, Syrian uh, vocalist Asala Nasri. I'm 
Welcome back to the uh, Pax Mondi show and um, we've just had a very, very interesting uh, uh, discussion with uh, Eamon Jundi uh, from the Syria Relief uh, Charity about the work that they're doing. If any of you out there can uh, help Syria Relief in any way uh, to do this uh, valuable uh, work, work in this uh, war-torn country, please uh, do. Um, so we've just got uh, about 10 minutes left. I, I'm uh, going to just talk about some of the uh, topical uh, news at the moment. The uh, news has continued to be uh, dominated by the uh, situation around uh, the um, NSA uh, whistleblower, um, Edward Snowden, and uh, his uh, plight in uh, Moscow, where he's currently uh, stranded in uh, uh, Moscow airport uh, without a passport, uh, following the uh, US government uh, revoking his passport. Um, he, he has no papers to move on. He had applied for uh, asylum to uh, a number of countries, but clearly, uh, the U.S. Uh, government has uh, been doing, uh, you know, everything it can to uh, put pressure, diplomatic pressure, on, on uh, countries not to give uh, Snowden asylum. So, um, about uh, 
up to last week, uh, it looked like e Ecuador was uh, going to provide him with uh, asylum, but then following the call that the, that the president um, uh, received uh, from uh, Joe Biden, the U.S. Uh, vice president, they rescinded that offer and uh, said they were, were no longer considering his uh, asylum application. Uh, so um, that, that was uh, the situation at the beginning of, of, of this um, week. And then so, since then, following the, uh, on the, the 2nd uh, of, of uh, July, when... Um, Evo Morales, the uh, president of Bolivia, uh, was returning from a gas producers uh, conference in Moscow. Uh, he was uh, f flying back uh, to Bolivia from Moscow, and he, he was uh, due to his flight was due to stop for refueling uh, in Portugal and then in Guyana. Now, uh, in the middle of the uh, journey, his plane was rerouted uh, to um, Vienna Airport in Austria. Uh, they were told that they had to land because uh, his passage uh, had been blocked. Uh, the uh, four states, uh, France, uh, Spain, Portugal and Italy had closed their airspace to Evo Morales' uh, plane and therefore they, they would not allow him. They knew his flight had been arranged, the uh, clearance had been agreed, uh, that they, they knew that he was coming but uh, all of those countries took a political decision to ground his aircraft in uh, Vienna where you know the, the um, Austrian uh, government then um, tried to search the plane um, clearly based on information that they'd been provided that Edward Snowden was on the plane and that that uh, information was clearly wrong. He wasn't on the plane. Uh, there, there, there were only Bolivian nationals and the French pilots on the plane, but they'd received that information from somewhere and they'd been, had pressure put on them uh, by, clearly by the US government. Uh, now, in fact, just that day, um, Evo Morales, uh, the Bolivian president, had been saying that he would be considering the uh, plight of um, Snowden and that, you know, Snowden what was, you know, a, 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 um, was in need of uh, justice. Now, uh, it, it's not been um, officially... Uh, uh, proven, but uh, the evidence is there that the U.S. government uh, put pressure on all of these states to block the access uh, to uh, Evo Morales to uh, ground the uh, Bolivian president's plane. Uh, what, what that has done in Latin America is to uh, create massive uh, resentment of the U.S. Uh, th this um, uh, activity of the, these European countries at the behest of the U.S. has really uh, angered people. Um, just the same day, on uh, the second last week, there were instantly demonstrations and flag burnings outside all of these European uh, embassies in Bolivia. The, the um, um, 4th of uh, July uh, celebrations by the uh, US embassy in 
uh, La Paz, uh, Bolivia had to be cancelled. Uh, Evo Morales has said they're actually going to close, they're considering closing the U.S. Embassy. They've already uh, sent the ambassador back. They don't have a U.S. ambassador there any longer, but he's talking about closing the embassy permanently. And the reaction from other Latin American states has also been very strong, you know, in solidarity with uh, Bolivia. Even uh, the um, uh, U.S.-dominated OAS, uh, which is based on uh, in Washington, the Organization of American States, condemned uh, what had happened completely. And uh, similar, stronger statements have been made by uh, the various um, uh, Latin American uh, uh, uni alliances, Mercosur, and um, also by uh, UNICEF. And there really is uh, outrage uh, amongst uh, people in uh, Latin America that their that one of their heads of state could be treated in this way, like, you know, he was a, a, a criminal by these European states. And, in fact, uh, it, it has backfired on the US it, it, to the extent that um, now three countries, three of those uh, countries, um, both Bolivia, Nicaragua uh, and Venezuela, have now offered Edward Snowden uh, asylum and they are now uh, negotiating, he's in negotiation with those uh, countries. So, you know, this, this is, uh, it really is a lesson to uh, the bully, you know, that, you know, their, their actions have created so they created exactly what they didn't want. So well done to the US. Uh, looks like Edward Snowden's going to get um, uh, asylum now. That brings us to the end of the show. Uh, thanks for listening to the uh, Pax Monday show on Dark City Radio. Good night. Uh,